The West Puget Community Connection Podcast. This is where we learn about the people of our community. We learn what they do, and more importantly, why they do it. Subscribe by email at westpugetcommunityconnection.com. We look forward to learning more about you. The West Puget Community Connection Podcast is brought to you in part by MyWebDesignServices.com. Quick, easy, affordable websites that look amazing across all devices. For a quote or to get started today, visit MyWebDesignServices.com. Welcome to the West Puget Community Connection Podcast, where we learn about the people in our community, what they do, and more importantly, why they do it. Our mission is to stimulate community engagement by creating a sense of community and rapport. We do that through interviews and storytelling with locals. You can listen to the podcast for free with unlimited streaming on our homepage at westpugetcommunityconnection.com. Contact us if you're interested in advertising or being featured on the show. And now, without further ado, we bring you this episode of the West Puget Community Connection Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Vincent Alexander speaking, and I'm the host of the show. And today I'm here at the Cape George Clubhouse in Port Townsend to spend some time with my new friend, Jacques Thierry. And just to give you some quick facts about Jacques, he's 80 years old, he lives here in Port Townsend, and he has spent his life sailing around the world in a ship called the Unicorn. Now, if you've ever watched the movie, I'm sorry, if you've ever watched the miniseries Roots, or any of the movies called The Pirates of the Caribbean, then you have seen this ship called the Unicorn, because it was used three times in the Pirates of the Caribbean, all three of those movies, and it was used as the Black Pearl. Now, uh, needless to say, Jacques is loaded with interesting sailing stories to share, and so I want to hear these stories and record these stories, and I want to share them with you. So here we go, a fun little documentary on the adventures of Jacques Thierry and the Unicorn. So, hello Jacques. Hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing I'm doing well. How are you, man? Well, I'm doing pretty good. It's a beautiful day here on on the edge of the water and uh, just great to be here. Yeah, it is beautiful. And just so the listeners know, yeah, we're at the clubhouse uh Cape George and we're looking over at Diamond Point on the other side of Discovery Bay. The water is gleaming like diamonds, blue sky, white clouds over the mountains. It's just beautiful. And uh we're in Jock's truck. So this ought to make a nice little space for us to, <laughs> to hang out. Yeah. Well, I'll give you a bit of a background. I, mean, I was born in Belgium. Belgium. In, uh, in 1939, and just before the Second World War. And uh, my parents uh, were very involved in that war. Uh, you must have been about five years old when that no, was happening. No, I actually, I was uh, uh, two or three. Uh, three years old when the effect of the war came. Uh, when it began. began, and uh, my father ended up in the underground, uh, hiding in the forest and do- committing mayhem to the invading troops. And uh, my mother uh, was a nurse, and uh, it- they have their own story, and I'm not going to get into it uh, today, but uh, they, they're a movie all by themselves. Sure. And uh, uh, fast forward until uh, I was six, seven years old, the war is ended. I ended up with tuberculosis, and I was incarcerated for uh, three years in a sanatorium because they didn't have any way to cure tuberculosis in those days. Oh, wow. And so uh, my father could not visit me during that period, but um, uh, he was trying to make a living after the Second World War, uh, and he ended up... um, 
discovering quite by accident that his parents had come to visit America in 1908 and uh, he was born in Manhattan. Oh, wow. But they had never registered him. Oh. And he thought he was a Belgian citizen until the day he went to uh, uh, inquire about getting a passport to travel throughout um, Europe with a um, small bus that he wanted to purchase and create a little tourist deal. And this was while I was uh, in the sanatorium and, and they, the Belgian embassy told them that they, uh, they had no records of his. Wow. And they said, well, where, where were you born? And I said, well, my parents were traveling throughout uh, the U.S. and I was born there. Well, go see the Americans and see what they say. And uh, at the age of 39 years old, he discovered that he was an American citizen. Wow. <laughs> Trippy. And they said, do you have any children? And they, he said, yeah, I have a son. Well, he's an American also. Wow. And so I was 11 years old when I discovered that I uh, was a U.S. citizen. And neither he nor I spoke. English at all, oh. and I never heard it spoken. As a matter of fact, wow! And uh, so, as I came out of the sanatorium, I was eleven, and he he said, "I'm going to go to see what our country is about." And uh, and so he left me with friends in Belgium, and he went to America, and uh, that's how we ended up coming here. You know, and you fast forward ahead, uh, I was with my mother until I was 16 in, in Paris because that's, she, she was a French woman. And then one day we ended up in New York. Our life in America began when I was 16 years old. And, and I lived with two people who were never meant to be with one another. They fought like cats and dogs oh, all, boy. all the time, and they fought over me oh. more than they fought uh, about anything else. And when I was 19, I left. I went into the, the Air Force and the U.S. Air Force. And um, when I was done with that, uh, I uh, attempted to come home but it didn't. Um, it, it was, Attempted to go back to Belgium? No, or to, come to, 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 oh. uh, to my parents. Back to and, America. Uh, but it was not uh, worthwhile. It wasn't worthwhile. So, no, so I, I ended up, uh, and my father had always told me that, you know, I can't afford to uh, pay for your uh, college. So your college is this, this suitcase and fill it with what you want to take with you and hit the road and uh, so when I was 21 or 2 I literally hit the road and uh, started looking around and I had a wow. hunkering for solitude because of my uh, home relationships and so on and so forth. And you wanted, I, because of all the yelling and the going, yelling and the screaming and all of this. You and wanted I, solitude and I peace. I wanted solitude and quiet, and quiet. Safety. And so I focused on the, the water. The sea. And uh, I happened to meet somebody that turned me on to sailing. And the man uh, had a 27-foot uh, sailboat. And I helped him fix it. And we went sailing. And from there came... I moved on to other boats, and um, you know I'm f obviously fast forwarding here to uh -huh. a whole period of my life. Sure, and you can spend as much time as you'd like uh, on any part of it. Yeah, well, whatever you think is important. To it, uh, uh, you know, it, it there was a lot of uh, search and discovery at that age in my twenties, mm -hmm. all the way. Uh, to the end of my 20s, uh, you know, went to uh, uh, Africa, got involved in uh, 
you know, expeditions for this or that, and a lot of, uh, you know, searching essentially my place in this world. Uh huh. Where do you belong? Where I belonged. And, and so, uh, by your late twenties, you had already made your way to Africa on a sailboat. I no, not on a sailboat. It was uh, uh, in a Land Rover uh, oh. with a with a group of people and like uh, a safari. Yeah, like a safari. Ooh. That's correct. And uh, so that was a an interesting period. And uh, the lady that I was with uh, became pregnant, and she uh, chose to want to come back to the U.S. to give birth to our common child, our son. And uh, so that cut the uh, African and uh, adventures short and came back and uh, she unfortunately got very involved with uh, a church that I couldn't get behind which mm -hmm. was Scientology and, oh, interesting. Uh, and uh, so she went her way and uh, I went my way and not too long after that I ran across someone that uh, uh, was wanting to go sailing uh, as much as I did and he had some money and I had a little bit of money um, and we pooled our effort together and uh, we ended up purchasing a uh, 45 foot uh, schooner that was the first wow that's a big boat <laughs> uh, but that was a big boat and by you know, uh, the universe works in a very, very interesting way. Isn't and, that the truth? And we just uh, cleaned it up. It was in a boatyard in in New Jersey, and we cleaned it up, peeled the paint, the white paint off of it, and it was varnished underneath it, and there was a different name than what was on it. Oh, wow. And it had been renamed at some it point. It had been renamed somewhere along the way. It was built in 1926, and it was one of the Roosevelt's um, personal yacht. Oh. And so we ended up sailing it uh, quite a bit uh, and learning our trade, Your our skills. vocation, and, uh, and my friend, uh, son, and his wife moved on board, and I would come from shore and uh, sail the boat with him, and so on and so forth, but his son, four-year-old Joey, fell overboard and drowned, oh, and, no. and that essentially killed any... Uh, any drive to want to sail the boat from him and his wife. He just didn't want to have anything to do with it. Didn't want to have anything to do with right. it, so I moved on board. And coincidentally, the engine was um, uh, dead on it and had to be hauled out. So all of a sudden, you had a 45 foot uh, sailboat on deck. I mean, it was much longer overall, but... Oh, 45 on, feet of deck. On, on deck, yeah. And it was a much longer boat than yeah, that overall. Yeah, it was, but the uh, engine was out. The engine was out, and I was living uh, at anchor in New York uh, in the, on the Hudson River, and, and wow. I would commute to work. And you had like a dinghy to get you to shore? Yeah, I have a dinghy to go ashore, and I would come back at night and live on board and, uh, you know and entertain friends uh, on board and huh. and then the only thing to do was to learn to sail it anywhere I want to without the engine and, oh. and that was really the, the one year of intense training huh sailing it, training practicing yeah. and experimenting and learning we'll let that truck pass by there and so, um, at the end of that period, uh, oh, my lord, uh, uh, Christopher, Chris wanted his, uh, his money out of the boat, so we ended And Chris, up, Chris is the gentleman who had the four-year-old who drowned? Yeah, that's right. So he want, he was an investor, he wanted his money well, out, he, out of it. He, 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 he wanted his money out of it because essentially he wasn't going to. He didn't sail want to have anything to do now. with it anymore. He 
didn't want to sail it any longer. So the boat was sold, uh, and uh, it was a short period of time where I was attempting to find a, a source of revenue, A and B, where was I going to go next? And um, at that point, I met someone uh, that wanted to spend their time with, with me, and we traveled to Europe uh, from Colorado, where I had taken residence uh, in the San Juan Mountains of Colorado, in, uh, in a place called uh, Silverton. As, uh, Silverton, Colorado. Silverton, Colorado. And so you, Population 312 at the time. Oh, a tiny town. Yeah. So you hooked up with someone and went to Europe with them? And then went to Europe together and uh, uh, had a, a adventures there. Uh, by buying a, a sailboat that someone was wanting to sell because they had punctured a hole in it on the rocks. So we did that, we... Uh, fixed it up? Fixed it up and sailed it, went to uh, the big uh, concerts at the Isle of Wight with, uh, you know, Bob Dylan and so on and so forth. So we, we did that and then on the return trip from that, uh, uh, adventure in in uh, the Isle of Wight in England, uh, we ended up caught in a uh, in a severe gale and uh, a gale like a storm. A storm, yeah. And uh, on the way back to America, on the way back not caught. to America, on the way back to Europe, to Europe from uh, from England, from England. And um, well, uh, we ended up. Wreck, shipwreck. Really? Yeah, oh yeah. We, uh, From the it, storm? It, oh yeah, it was... How did it wreck the ship? Did it just... Oh, well, it wrecked it by essentially not being able to... Uh, Couldn't... In the middle of the night when you're sailing and you cannot see... Uh, the waves are uh, 10 to 12 feet, and you're a, on a 26-foot double-ended sailboat. Uh, and from one side of the wave comes an object which punctures a hole through the hull. Oh. And you take in water and... Uh, it sunk? Did that ship sink? Uh, oh, yeah, it's it sunk. Yeah, oh you bet. Gosh. Yeah. So you guys were, took to got on a life so, raft? Well, no. Uh, I we sealed the the puncture the the hull so that air remained trapped in the uh, in the cabin and it's just barely was afloat and wow. And uh, we got rescued by a tanker and I could go. I could make a hole podcast out of that that event. event. Yeah, it was. It was incredible, and uh, so let me get this straight: the 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 storm punctured a hole. In well, the storm did not. The the fact that it was a telephone pole or a piece of a dock or something. Oh, some object floating, floating down on the backside, and we came down the wave. Bam! And struck bam, it. And that yeah, put a hole. Put a hole right in through the, the hull, and water came in and. You know, we realized we so were, you sealed the cabin space yeah, so that it to, was like a bubble of air, and, and that floated and the ship, and that's what kept it floating. And then, that, so that's what kept you guys on top of the surface, on top, not freezing to death in the, yeah, in the water. And, uh, and then along comes a big tanker and picks and, you guys up and rescues you. Know, you. We were several hours uh, signaling with uh, a high-powered light uh, to tankers, and we could see them passing on the horizon. And after several hours, one of them picked up the signal and turned around and came back and decided to help us out. And, and uh, then the rest of the story goes as to how did we get out of that mess. But, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can tell as much as you want, man. You know, we can do was, as many of these podcasts as you, episodes as you want. Oh so you God. can go into as much detail as you yeah, want with each well, story. 
uh, on that particular if I if I stop at that without going any further it uh, it was a harrowing experience and the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the friend of mine whom um, was there he was a uh, a pilot crop duster pilot oh. and uh, he kept saying you know that uh, what a slow torturous way to die waiting to drown as opposed to flying a crop duster and planting it in the ground and you're gone in a oh. matter of minutes and uh, he, and because it took a long time for getting a signal to somebody in the meantime right. you're going up 10, 12 feet up in the air, down, you know, oh, the waves, man. and, uh, you know. You're scared the whole time, you don't know how this is going to end. You don't know how it's all going to end, and, uh, and finally the stanker came, and it was an, a Sicilian uh, tanker, an Italian from Sicily. It was a tanker carrying um, liquid nylon. Liquid nylon? Yeah, I had never known that. And the nylon came into a liquid form, oh. and uh, he, uh, you know, obviously, we didn't speak Italian. I speak French fluently, for, of course, but and English didn't seem to mean anything to them. So, you know, with hand signal, and we're like about, uh, you know, thirty, fifty feet away from the stern of this humongous ship that doesn't seem to be moving much in the water and we are going up and down up and down uh -huh. because, but he's just he's not nice a, and steady he, yeah he's not affected by it and he's hand signals about uh, uh, and I'm trying to explain to him that I wanted him to get on a radio and call the French Coast Guard to come and pick us up you know and uh, no, no, no. Once he understood, he, he wasn't said, going. To, get we're, it. we're going to do it. Get you on know, board. We're we'll we're the guys it. who are going to do it. Oh, and, I see. Uh, we're your sa we're we're here to save you. Yeah, we're here to save you. And that was a bad move. Oh, really? Uh, all around. Yeah, they didn't know what they were doing. They oh, had no. never done anything like that. But they were pumped. They were going to oh. do it. So they threw us a line, and you know, we're on your own. You're on a 26 foot sailboat. The stuff that you're using for line is this big, and they throw you a hawser that's that big because that's what they got on board. They don't uh -huh. have a little rinky dink little uh -huh. line. And so we had to, and you know, make a way to attach that to the mast of the the boat and, and uh, drag it out of there and just bring it up slowly to the stern of the uh, tanker and um, uh, my uh, ex-wife she became my ex-wife uh, that was on board at the day, my girlfriend at the time, we got her off, they threw a oh, line. so you had her with you? Yeah, we had her with me. And so it was three of you in total? There were three of us on board. Oh boy, she was like, why did I ever get on board oh, with this, well, to this ship? Oh well, especially for her, it was a new, Very scary. Very scary because she uh, is a person <clears throat> that is chronically sick on anything that has this kind of movement and you no, know, we're going up and down eight uh, this ten, is the worst feet conditions. and she was seasick as anything and uh, uh, so we uh, they threw a line we and then they hauled her about 25 30 feet up to the the deck of the tank. Oh, you just tied the rope around yeah, her? Yeah, and, and they just hauled her off the deck. Pulled her right up. Yeah, and my friend Alan uh, says they had also thrown a, what's called a Jacob's Ladder. And oh. it, it's a ladder that has wooden uh, steps on, Oh, yeah, on a alternating. Rope. Oh, yeah. on a rope. On a rope. And they, they threw that down. And I... I told Alan, I said, be very careful, I said, because uh, you got to catch it when we are up, and then you jump and grab it and continue going Holding up. on, going up. 
And of course, he was anxious to get off, and he caught it when we were down. Oh, no. <laughs> so uh, by the time uh, he had gotten hold of it, the sea came, and he was under the water, say, 10 feet, and he, when the wave passed, he came out spluttering. And, and he's trying to climb, climb up before climb the next wave comes. Before the next wave came, and he and up he went. And, uh, and I could see them being covered with blankets and taken away. They got him on the deck, though. Yeah, and meantime, I'm still... Uh, my turn's next. Uh, How am I going to get tiller, over? And I, you know, uh, I had this fixation. I'm not going to lose this boat. I'm not going to lose it. And they, they uh, so I took that line and they paid it out. They let it out for well, 400 feet behind them. And it was floating on the surface, and I tied a shorter line up to the bow, up to the mast, and uh, and they just let it out and uh, dragged it behind the ship. And, and, and then I said, "Okay, go ahead, you know, go forward, slow, you know." Uh -huh, and of slow. course, what's slow for me is not slow for, for them. a big you tanker. Know, oh God, and they. So they, they just took, ripped that ship apart. Yeah, they just uh, went too fast, and the anchor point at the bow popped off. Now, the vessel was um, essentially tied up to the mast in the center, so it was like water skiing. You know, you can go about parallel with what's towing you, and at one point you you have to be able to turn back behind it, but that didn't happen because... So it just sort of the drifted was, to the side? And so it just went sideways and down. And down? Down it went, yeah. Oh, it got... It well, caught it, the water and just sunk, and, went down. It just went down, and I was tied up to it, so down... You went down with it? I went down underwater? with it. Underwater? Yeah, absolutely. And How uh, far did you go down underwater? Oh, it's hard to say. Uh, maybe... Uh, five, ten feet at the most, oh and, and it, you know the line was like a bar going into the ocean. They said, and the boat had disappeared. It was under, and uh -huh. so they put their engine in reverse, and um, and when the line slacked off because of the air trapped in the hull, it floated it, back up to the top floated back up and so did you and so did I how long were you under for a couple of minutes oh um, my gosh you know uh, that's about what was your condition when you came up oh I was fighting mad I mean I was yeah I mean pissed off because they should have thought of that at the very least if nothing else they should have called the French Coast Guard uh. because the Coast Guard in uh, France and Belgium and all of those countries they have uh, power boats designed with a cut out stern so that you can put your stern into oh. it and they tie you up and <clears throat> it's a rescue boat yeah it's yeah. made for taking they're a ship made back. for that yeah. and uh, but they didn't want to do it and so uh you know now i'm tied up and i untie myself and they started pulling the line closer and closer closer to the stern oh i see so they're bringing you closer and closer yeah to the, now to the i'm ship. like uh, you know maybe five feet away from uh, and they threw me a, a line, I put a, uh, a bite into it, a circle, and I put it around one arm and over, and they kept yelling something. They wanted me to put it under On both arms. arms so that they could pull, and I didn't want to do it. Uh, and they started hauling, you know, me off the deck of Pulling you my boat. Uh, and uh, Into the air. And I'm in the air, and wouldn't you know, they dropped the line. They dropped Some, it? Yeah, somehow something got 
fouled up on deck, and, and they just... Uh, how far the, did you drop? Well, I dropped right there where the propeller was. <laughs> right where the... Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this propeller is about the size of this building right there. Huge. Oh, like a 30 foot. Oh, yeah. Prop. I mean, the blades on the, on the prop was probably and each blade. There's four blades on these. So you're blades. in the current of that now. Yeah, and I could see it turning. Oh my God! Next to me, and uh, Jeez and Louise. I'm under the under the water, and I'm pushing myself, uh, you know, under, so that I am essentially not get sucked in to that. And uh, oh my and gosh, then, my heart is pounding listening to this. And then um, pretty soon, I, you know, uh, popped off away from it and came out and the line was still dangling there <laughs> so I grabbed it and I just held on to it <laughs> and yanked a few on times to let them know to let them know and they hauled and hauled and I finally got on deck they got you up and up on on deck yeah and you know uh, as an aside uh, that boat it was a beautiful double ender meaning it was uh, built in Norway and it didn't have a square stern, it had a pointy stern. And um, we spent a lot of time fixing it up in Calais, in, on, on the coast of France, when we got it. And uh, I renamed it, and my friend Alan, who is close to my age now, and uh, we often, when I see him every three, four years, uh, talk about it. And he says, you know, it was your fault. You should not have renamed that boat. You shouldn't have renamed it? He yeah. thought that maybe that was yeah. a bad yeah. omen. It was bad a luck. bad omen. And it, you know, well, when you think about it, you could put some value to that. By uh, essentially, the boat's name was, was, um, um, oh, Lyra, I think. It Lyra was. was the original name? Yeah, right. And I renamed it Mephisto. Mephisto. Because I had read a book called Mephisto's Dance. Mephisto's and what it Dance. is, Mephisto is another name for the devil. Oh, Mephisto, and another he, name for the devil. Yeah, and Alan never wanted to name it, uh, name it that. So he called, every time he talked about the boat before we went, uh, across with it and everything else. Oh, the Memphis too. Yeah, uh, that's our boat. It's right there. The Memphis. He called it the Memphis because he, he didn't too. like. No, no, no. It he didn't want to say Mephisto. He didn't want to call, say that. Yeah, and so he told me uh, when it was all over. He, he said, said you, you should never should, should never have named that boat Mephisto. <laughs> So we were Maybe. on the tanker now. You're on the tanker. And uh, uh, they, it, the boat was still attached to the mast, and they just put the engine on at a higher speed, and it was like a steel bar pulling this boat, and it would not break up, it would not sink, and they just... Dragged it. Dragged it behind it until finally the mass snapped off. The and mass then it went down. snapped off and then it went down. So Mephisto yep. is at the bottom of the sea. It's at the bottom of the sea. And then, uh, uh, I don't know, a month or so later, uh, I got a uh, call from uh, the consulate in uh, uh, Holland. Uh, they said, oh, there's a fisherman here that... Uh, uh, he's returning something of yours, and I had a watch with my name, and they caught it in their net. No they caught way. the boat in their net. The whole boat? The whole boat. Brought up the whole ship, found yeah, the watch. and they found my watch in, in the boat, and Amazing. I still have it to this day. Wow, what a relic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's an awesome relic. I know. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Uh, anyway, once we were on board that tanker, it was on its way when before it turned around to see what we needed. Uh, it was on its way to Amsterdam in Holland. Oh, and from Sicily so, to Amsterdam. Yeah, so they were on their way into Amsterdam. And when we got on board, uh, the captain uh, gave me his cabin 
to go and lay down and rest. And, um, you know, Alan and Barbara were in a separate cabins of crew members and so on and so forth. But we noticed that everybody was walking around with gas masks. And we yeah, thought, why? What in heaven's name? What are they, what are they expecting? Yeah. Well, apparently, uh, liquid nylon is highly flammable. So here we are coming into the harbor of Amsterdam. Oh, excuse me, Rotterdam. I'm getting my cities mixed up. So you're coming into the harbor of where? Rotterdam. Rotterdam. And uh, so we're coming in, and it's uh, it's Europe's biggest uh, harbor. Oh, by far. Huge. Yeah, it's huge, and they have different. Uh, waterways going to different slips and so on and so forth and we're coming in and uh, something happened no way don't tell me the nylon ignited. yeah not the nylon a crew member uh, happened to be I don't know what they were doing but uh, happened to release the main anchor <gasps> release as, the main anchor as we are into the channel oh, and yeah. the anchor grabbed and the ship started heading toward the docks. Oh no! And uh, out of control. The, out of control. And the alarm sounded. Everybody's donning mask, and they're running up mask. and down the waterway. And we are out of our cabin and saying, "What is going on?" The nylon's about to be everywhere. Well, yeah. If and uh, so and you're about if to they hit the the, 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 the shore, dock. we are done. Yeah. And. Uh, Collision. And they let the anchor line go, the you know, and oh, they let the it chains, go. the links on the chains are about like this. They're just, huge, uh -huh. you know, and they just let it all, and the chain weighs so much that it essentially busted the stops from right out of the uh, um, the bow, and they were able to before it get it in reverse put yeah and, and they had it in reverse and they managed to stop it before it hit the shore wow and it's like you know a distance from here to uh, Beckett Point and uh, so you know it takes that, that I mean that's well, like a it mile takes a away long, it takes a long time to stop, to stop the tanker. one of the tanker oh, yeah. and it was about 600 feet long so oh my gosh uh, you know they uh, they manage and then the authorities uh, well of course you know uh, anybody that had a uniform showed up when we arrive at the docks everybody uh, you, uh -huh. the, Every agency, every agency, every agency to you investigate, can investigate, write a yeah, ticket, they, <laughs> and everybody is gesticulating and uh, you know screaming. And, yeah, who's to blame? Yeah, and so on, and so forth. And the U.S. consulates were uh, alerted that they uh, three Americans were picked up, and so they came on board. And uh, oh, what an event! Wow. And so they, uh, uh, we told our story and. And they pulled us off the ship, and uh, Alan got down on his knees and <laughs> so and kissed the ground. Kissed and the he ground. Said, Boy, this was close. This I was said, close. yes, it was. I said, uh, very close. And uh, so that was the adventure of the uh, shipwreck. Yeah. Wow, the adventure of the shipwreck. Yeah. yeah of the yeah. Mephisto. Yeah, uh, the Mephisto. The yeah. Mephisto. Uh, the Mephisto, M-E. Oh, my gosh. It really was almost like you had a curse or something. Yeah, it That's was. just like everything that could go wrong. Yeah. And, you know, when uh, we crossed from uh, England to the from the Alawai back to France, uh, it was a beautiful cruise. And uh, we arrived in uh, in a small harbor on the coast of France, and uh, you know this was a, a landing spot uh, arriving in France. And I went to see the harbor master. This is all before having access to things like this, like cell phones cell phone. and laptops have, and yeah, technology. Essentially, like if you wanted to know what the weather was going to be, you went and talked to the harbor master. Oh. And he hopefully was in the know as to what was coming. 
did he know more than you do? I don't know. Wow. Probably not. Wow. That's but, how you, you know, found he out looked it. up in the sky and said, yeah, I think it's going to be all right. <laughs> you know, and I was pretty much. You just much, read the signs. Yeah, and... read the, uh, the clouds and what have you. And so I went and asked weatherman. him. simple weatherman. And I said, hey, uh, what uh, what's the weather like for uh, tomorrow? We are going to go about uh, 20, 30 miles from here to a, a little town called saint valery sur somme which is a tiny little harbor. But it's, it's a peculiar little harbor because it's also an entrance to the canals of France. And so you, we were planning on dismasting the boat and motoring through the canals of France Neat. to go to the Mediterranean oh. and then end up in the south of France without having to go around the whole of Spain in order oh, to get to the same. Cut through. Cut right through. And he said, oh, I think the weather is going to be good. It's going to be a little breezy, but nothing that you can't handle. So this is a smaller boat. Yeah, you know, and I said, well, okay. Uh, I, I'll take your word for it. He says, yeah, it looks good. And so in the morning we left and uh, it was blowing on the Beaufort scale, a tree, which is probably around uh, in U.S. Uh, figures uh, around 12, 10 to 12 uh, mile per hour wind which was good yeah. wind for us to go where we were going. and uh, But as we the day progressed... Uh, so conditions looked good at first? At first, looked very good. Uh -huh. And we were about halfway down to our destination and... 15 miles in? Yeah, then it, uh, you know, it's starting to blow like 20. Oh, uh, and now it's a little too... And now strong. it's... And then it's increasing to 25. And oh, the, boy. And the seas became bigger and bigger. And uh, and we ended up right in front of saint valery sur somme that small town. And uh, we were like... Uh, we would be uh, about half halfway to Beckett Point. And, uh, and there was a foam, white foam bar of water piling up at the entrance of the harbor. A white foam bar of yeah, water? like a... because it was so shallow at the entrance. And oh, so you were so getting a wave was crashing. So, it was yeah, cresting and, and just a long, and broken told, wave. Yeah, I told Alan, I said, we're not... We're, we're not, not going gonna, to go through that? We're not going in. We're not said, going in? No, no. So we don't want to get hit by that wave? I said, if, if we do, we're going to hit bottom. We're gonna, and oh, said, because we'll, it was too shallow. Too shallow. We'll crash yeah. and sink right there in the front of the harbor. Yeah. He says, oh, but look, we're it's so right close. right there, but we're so close. Yeah, so close, you know. Yeah. I said, no, Does, we're not matter. doing it. We're not doing we're it. We're not doing and, it. And I said, you know, we're going to ride it out at sea. We have to just rock around until and the wind so chills out. so we just turn around and slowly head it out. You know, uh, to see just to kind of do some circles out and, there, and uh, and that's when in the middle of the night we uh, that telephone pole uh, found us in the wrong. That's day. how it happened. That's how it happened. That's how it happened. Yeah. So you were really not even that far. No, we off. were from the shore. We were only uh, by the time. Uh, well, we were probably six, seven miles offshore when it happens. You know, uh, and. Just trying to ride we it were, out. Uh, yeah, if the weather had been what the harbor master claimed it was going to be, we could have gone right in, and that right. this story would not exist at all. Right. So, so that, and if a telephone pole or whatever that was hadn't come by and put a hole in you your know, boat, you might have rocked and rolled all night. Rock and, and roll then, until uh, the weather uh, calmed down, and then we would have turned around and gone into the harbor after all. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, that that's the, how the it history went. of sailing, you know. So, uh, yeah, uh, a very interesting time. And, uh, uh, and then, uh, um, you know, I came back to the U.S., after that, and uh, so did uh, 
my friend Barbara and uh, and we moved to Colorado. Uh, and why Colorado? Well, because uh, we were um, connected essentially by a hitchhiker that we picked up. Wow! Uh, along the way, oh, are you, where are you going? Well, uh, Barbara is from Los Angeles, so I'm driving uh, with a Volkswagen van, which I had, uh, to Los Angeles. And uh, we'll, uh, he said, well, he said, uh, would you mind making a small detour? Uh, he says, it's hardly going to notice, you're, you're not going to notice the difference instead of going... So you were like taking I-40? or Yeah, we were on uh, probably 80. 80? And then he says, just head south and go in through uh, the western side of the state of Colorado and come through uh, uh, Montrose and uh, Silverton and Durango and uh, all these towns. And he says, I live in Durango, and from Durango, it's a straight shot to Los Angeles. And I said, well, all right, you know, why okay. not? Okay, if it's no loss to yeah, us, then... Yeah, and so we headed that way, and uh, um, we ended up uh, going through Silverton, and uh, Silverton is one of the highest towns in the U.S., Oh, really high altitude. Very high altitude. So your, your the bus town, is just the town choking. is at ninety three hundred feet. Oh, it's really way up there. And uh, so, but he knew people in the town. He knew the newspaper editor and what have you. And he let me introduce you to this fellow. And uh, the scenery was A beautiful, huh? spectacular. Yeah, it was I like Colorado State is beautiful. Oh, it is just, I mean, uh, something to behold. And, so he uh, wanted you to slow down, spend a little time there yeah, with him. Yeah, and he said, let me introduce you. And so I met the newspaper editor of the uh, Silverton Miner and... Uh, and uh, you know, and conversation got going. And I wanted, uh, don't you? Uh, do you have anything to do in LA? I said, no, I really don't want to be in LA. I'm just uh, dropping off Barbara. And he said, well, he says, uh, stay here. Why don't you stay here? <laughs> and he says, I'll show you a place that's for rent. And so, how cool, man! A long and the short, uh, within a matter of. Uh, few hours we were up on this pass uh, coal bank uh, hill coal bank mountain and uh, chattanooga pass is the at uh, ten thousand eight and there was this cabin at, at the pass uh -huh. and he says you can have that for twenty five dollars a month and, oh wow and you know even then twenty five dollars yeah, that wasn't much, you know, uh -huh. and and so we went and looked at it, and uh, oh wow, this you is know, an opportunity. It's one big room, and so on, and so forth. There's a stove. There's no water. Well, don't worry. The snow is. Uh, I mean, you always can, melting. <laughs> yeah, you can always uh, have as much water as you want. You all you have to do is melt, and uh, I mean, uh, and. You know, next thing I know, I said, yeah, you know, this would be an adventure. Let's yeah. do this. for. This will be an adventure. Yeah. And so uh, the long and the short is, is uh, we drove on to Los Angeles. How long did you stay there in Colorado, though? Uh, that, that and to that to be a four winters in a row. Wow. Four years. Uh, yeah. In the uh, cabin. Not during the Way summer. Way during oh, Four but winters. Way, four winters. Way up there with Way lots of there, snow. Yeah, lots of snow and what have you. And, and you uh, made it work. You survived we, up there. We moved uh, into the cabin after our return, uh, a short stay in L.A. Moved okay. into the cabin. And uh, not long after, oh, I don't know, a couple of months, and this is in the middle of the winter where we're talking about snow uh, up to 16 feet you know, you can hardly see the cabin. You have to dig a pass, a just to tunnel, get, to all get you out see is, to the highway, oh, which, you know, is... The all, cabin gets completely covered in covered. snow. And, uh, You're under 
under snow, basically. The owner of the cabin was having a feud with someone else who claimed that he owned it, and they started <laughs> taking pot shot at each other pot with a rifle. You know, with right, a right. rifle? Oh, yeah. They, they were, were shooting, shooting, at, each shooting at each other, and we were in the middle. We were in the cabin. And, uh, you geez. know, we decided, you know. Let's get this, the heck out of here. Let's get out of here. You know, this is crazy. Wow, these guys were just and so we in did. the hills. Now, and a little, maybe, maybe a little disconnected. One was a um, uh, mailman, and I can't <laughs> remember what the other one was. I'd like to see that in the newspaper. <sighs> Yesterday, the mailman and so and so were arrested for shooting <laughs> rifles at each other. At each other. <laughs> over a feud. Over, over, a over a who feud. owns the, the cabin. <laughs> this cabin and climbing on. Oh, I mean, it was ridiculous. Oh so gosh. we moved into town. In Colorado, uh, in into Silverton, and Silverton. we ended up staying there for uh, basically uh, four winters in a row. We would leave once the snow melted, and I came back when the snow flew. And I, I and I traveled to uh, uh, Florida and uh, crude, and what was that? Crude, crude, crude. Uh, yeah, crude. Uh, become a crew member on board. Oh, the, you crewed. You were yeah, a crew member. Yeah, on board different uh, multi-hull boats. Multi -hull that's that's boats. what I was interested in. And so I got to try different uh, vessels, different boats. And, oh. and then when the summer was over, I'd, we'd come back to uh, Silverton and uh, continue living there. And there's lots of adventure that happened in Silverton and but one of them is that in the course of our, our adventure in Europe we had met uh, I should say I didn't but my ex uh, because she is now my ex-wife um, met three guys on board a freighter coming back from Europe um, because that was a cheap way to travel mm -hmm. and uh, in those days and uh, and these three young men uh, Swedish with backpack Swedish blue yellow cross flag on the back of their backpack they were on their way uh, to the US traveling across the country to uh, hopefully finding a berth and a ride to the South Sea. That's what's their dream. Mm. Okay, that's what they were doing. And we met him and, um, uh, you know, like you meet hitchhikers on their way to somewhere and then you say goodbye and, oh, by the way, if you're ever, uh, you know, in uh -huh. Colorado and... Uh, you come through uh, a town called Silverton. Remember, silver, the silver ton, Silverton. And uh, I said, you know, give me a call, and uh, we can have coffee and, uh, and visit. And, and three months went by, and one day the town sheriff uh, came to see us and say, hey, there's a phone call at, uh, at the station Yes, a fellow that is asking for you. Said, wow, really? Mm -hmm. And so I went with him to uh, the sheriff's office, and by God, it was one of the three Swedes. It was one of them. One of them. And he says, oh, I don't know if you remember us, and uh, this and that. I said, yeah. And, uh, where are you? Well, we're in Durango, 50 miles from you. And uh, I wonder if you'd... Uh, be inclined to have us uh, stay overnight. You know, well, yeah, sure. Uh, why don't you come? Do you have wheels? Uh, how are you traveling? Yeah, we bought a car in uh, Michigan and uh, and we're traveling across the country with this car. Uh, okay, well, come, come on, on up. Come on up. And so they showed up and stayed three months. <laughs> <laughs> And we had the best of time. Together. Oh, really? Oh, That's awesome. The best of time. The best of time. We went mountain climbing, gold digging, and oh. all of the above. That and sounds fun already. Yeah, it was it was great. And I tried to get him get them work uh -huh. at the mine. 
uh-huh. Ekla. Ekla. Ekla had a mine. And uh, so the few connections I had in the town of Silverton, population 312, I got him to go and... They got some work? And uh, they came back and said, oh, no, they don't want us. Don't want to do that. And I said, uh, well, what happened? And they said, well, we're too young, they said. We're too young? They said we're too I young. I said, well... How old are you? Too young. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, these guys were... Adults. I mean, they, you know, they, the way they travel with a mustache, smoke cigarettes, beret on one of them. I mean, they were... I said, well, how old are you? He's, and um, one of them, his name was Birier. 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 Birier Motz, M-O-T-T. And Olaf. No, Yuri, Mats, and Olaf. And I said, well, how old are you? He said, well, I'm the oldest. I'm 17. Oh, these were kids. Oh, wow. I and they're guess. traveling around the uh, world I, freely. How old are you, Mats? Mats. He said, I'm 16. 16. And uh, Olaf is 15. 15, I said, Jesus, I am having kids staying with us. And... I'm and thinking they're ad- adults. And they can't even get work because... That, well, of course. They can't get work, oh, no. you know. And uh, I'm like, oh, my goodness. And Brave kids, You man. would never have believed it if you had seen them. Never would have imagined. No. They were so the young. youngest one looked about maybe 18. And uh, Berrier looked like he was in his early 20s. And, you know, they you looked they like were young, young men. Out in the world, on the yeah, own. Yeah, and they yeah. were heading for the South Seas. And wow, at 15 years old. Yeah, yeah, let's go to the South Seas. See, let's go to the South it's Seas. It's been my dream my whole life. <laughs> yeah, my whole life, yeah. And uh, I said, God, I couldn't believe their parents would... Just let them go. Just let them go. And, uh, <laughs> Maybe yeah. they didn't. <laughs> and uh, so they stayed with us for three months. And during that time... I talked a lot about sailing because... Uh, These they, were not sailors to begin no, with. No, no, no. Okay. And uh, they lived in a small town in uh, uh, Sweden called Viken, V-I-K-E-N. Viken. Viken, Sweden. Viken, Sweden. And uh, they said, oh, God, you are looking for a, uh, a larger ship? I said, yeah, I'm looking for a larger ship. Uh, I said, I'd like to find something that's um, eh, maybe around 65, 70 feet long on deck. Uh, big, solid, old-fashioned, uh, square rig ship. That's a big, big boat. Yeah, he said, oh, well, he said, you know, there is one in my town. He said, well, I'm in it. Let me dig through my, um, my bag. And he pulled out this postcard. Uh-huh. that his mother had sent him uh, in Michigan, and it was a postcard of the town. Uh-huh. And along the harbor, featured in the harbor, was this, this ship. ship. And he says, I know the owner of that ship, and I know he's selling it. Wow. And I looked at it, I said, oh my goodness, this is perfect. perfect. This is just what I'm looking for. I said, Can, do you have a way to, to write to this man? Because... It was snail mail. It was only. going across the world yeah, to the other side. And of the- so he says, "Yeah, yeah." He says, uh, "So he wrote a letter in Swedish to his mother to connect with the fellow that owned the ship and tell him that he had someone in th- Colorado, in Colorado, <laughs> that was interested in buying his his ship." Boy, and word uh, of mouth. And you know, it took bunch of time for the letter to get there uh-huh. and letter to come back so weeks you know, and weeks weeks a, a month and a half before i got other pictures and uh, oh she, a month and a half before you yeah, he, he the yeah, wrote and back and i had pictures of the uh, the ship which was called kimbet, kimbet. Uh, it was a name that he gave to the ship kim and beth kim his two and daughters beth. kim beth kim beth and um and she looked like a pirate ship. I mean, oh. totally with a great poop deck in the back, and uh, I mean, 
painted black with a white stripe. I mean, wow. it, it was spectacular. How neat. Two masts, uh, you know, beautiful. And oh, wow, I was so excited. I said, finally, I'm getting. Is this like what they call a tall ship? It with... would not have fallen into the tall ship category because it was not square uh, rig. Uh huh. The mast did not have yards. Got it. The it, masts were not horizontal to the. Hull. No, they. Uh, the, that's right. The the yards were not horizontal. It had gaffed sail on it. It was a what would have been called a catch. A catch. A catch with two uh, masts. Two, two masts, two head sail, a main, and a mizzen. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, the boys. The boys, <laughs> the boys literally. Uh, they were running out of money by then because the money that they had saved to go to the South Sea, they ended up using it across the country. They stayed too long in Michigan. They bought this car. They arrived in Colorado. They stayed three months with us, and it became evident that they didn't have the means to go further, so they decided that Time to go home. Time to go home. They had had a fabulous adventure anyway. Good for them. And so they turned around and went home. And uh, I drove them uh, to Florida. And they from flew Colorado? From Colorado. And, Boy, you gave them a long ride all the way. Yeah, and took them to Miami Airport so that they could fly directly from Miami to uh, uh what year are we talking about? Uh, we are talking about 1969-70. Okay, 69-70. Yes, 69-70. Yeah, I have to look at my notes. Mm -hmm. So, but I uh, um, took him there and they left him off and uh, we came back to Colorado and... Uh, uh, you know, there was a feeling of loss because they had been with us for yeah. three months. The house all of a seemed sudden, empty all was, of a sudden. Uh, they, they, nobody else was there. Uh -huh. It was just Barbara and I. And like, oh, man, uh, well, why don't we go to Sweden? <laughs> all right. Let's go see that boat. Let's go see that boat and let's buy it. Yeah. And uh, we packed up our belongings. And, and ended up going to uh, Hoboken, New Jersey, and uh, found a freighter from Poland, and it was a Soviet, because it was still the Soviet era, you know. Oh, yeah. And uh, we found this uh, Soviet ship that was willing to transport us, including the Volkswagen, and uh, we had, uh, I think, two dogs then at the time. They took the dogs too, and the two of us, and they had a cabin for occasional passengers because there was freighter. And uh, I think the whole thing ended up costing us, including the Volkswagen, $125 wow. per person. Oh. So two, uh, 250 to 250 for the two of us the dogs the car the van the, the, van, to the get whole from thing. New Jersey all the way to and then drop us off in in uh, in France that was one of their stop and uh, you just drove your van right off the ship and they pulled hit the road up and put it on on the dock we it's just amazing to me that you could do these things I know but you see, this was the cream of the cream of time. These were to the be days alive. when you had freedom. You had freedom in a way that is unknown now. Today, there's, nothing, Today there's just so much regulation and so much paperwork yeah, and permits. And the, and everything cost an arm and a leg. Cost an arm and a leg. And uh, in those days, I you mean. You could just grab your dog, throw him in the van, and go you know, to Sweden. <laughs> gas was like 25, 25 cents a gallon. Wow, this is cool to hear these stories. I mean, you don't, uh, you didn't even 
consider. You didn't even worry about gas no, money. No, 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 not at all. You could beg for change and go anywhere you want. Yeah, absolutely. It was, uh, it, it was totally different than it is now. And uh, so we drove from uh, uh, Le Havre in France to Sweden, and uh, you know, um, and I arrived in Sweden after taking a ferry from Denmark to uh, Sweden because there was no bridge at the time. Now oh, there, now there's, there's a bridge, a bridge now? going across from Denmark to Sweden. To Sweden, yeah, it's a whole different world. I hear. I, I don't oh. think I'd like it. Uh, um, and we arrive in Viken, Sweden. Viken, Sweden, and, and found the boys. Here's <laughs> the ship. There's in the, the ship. Harbor. You saw it when we come. When you came and in, you saw it. There it was. It. There and, it was. Uh, Kimbeth. You know, we drove right down to it and uh, straight to it. Yep. And uh, you know, start to admire it. Yeah, we're looking at it and everything else. And uh, here's this little guy, built like a tank. I mean, no neck. No at neck. All. I mean, just massive guy. Uh -huh. His name. He was a Finn. A Finn from Finland. His name is Perti. Perti. Perti Tarvers. And Perti was the owner of this oh. ship. And uh, we went up to him and, uh, hello, Mr. Tarvers, uh, you got our letter that we were coming. And his face fell. <gasps> he said, you really made it. You really got he here. He says, my You're God, serious you about... were serious. You were serious. I said, yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, we drove all the way from Colorado and took a ship across and everything else. And of course, that whole adventure from Colorado with to uh, Hoboken, New Jersey. He wasn't even expecting you. He didn't even know he that He had forgotten that we'd written the letter and he sold it to somebody else. Oh no, it had already been sold? <laughs> yeah, he <laughs> sold it. He sold it to two Americans from Chicago. Oh, oh well, how'd they jump on it so quick? And, uh, I guess they got there faster or what? Oh, uh, I don't <laughs> Jeez, know. Louise. I don't know how they connected with him. And uh, Well, that was that. Uh, so God. then what? <laughs> What do you do and then? He then? was just, beside himself. He was beside him because he because you had come across the world. Yeah, essentially we had come from you know thousands of miles away to buy his ship, and he had sold it to somebody else. And that whole story of what happened to Kimbit is that is a story all by itself. What what ended up happening to oh, the ship? Oh yeah, I ended up owning it anyway. You did? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, after the two people that had purchased it. Uh, so did you buy it directly from them? Uh, yeah, basically. Uh -huh. And uh, they, uh, they were probably well-meaning individuals, you know, but uh, they... Uh, didn't know anything about sailing. Uh, they had this. They bought the big, big boat. Visual thing uh, that we are going to re um, create um, the crossing of uh, Eric the Red. What's that? That's Eric the Red was a Viking well known for having um, travel from. Scandinavia over uh, oh so they were gonna follow that and they path. were gonna follow that route and end up bring, bringing the the ship to Chicago and they, they had Mayor Daly that was Mayor Daly in those days Mayor uh, Daly What's Mayor that? Daly Mayor Daly who was the mayor of Chicago and oh Mayor Daly was the mayor of Chicago yeah and he uh, and he had written this they had written this long article and it was published in the their paper, intentions their intention of bringing it across by these two guys with a volunteer crew that they were going a to a volunteer put. crew and, and they, they had were no going to do, and to. they had no clue as to what they were doing. They were uh, well-known kayakers. They, uh. they, you know, they had kayaked here, there, and everywhere. They had, but kayaking and, and sailing and, and are sailing, obviously two different things. Not thing. the same thing, especially when your ship is like ninety feet long. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, they they didn't have a clue, and so the adventures of their 
uh, attempting to take it uh, along the coast of Sweden and then Norway and they went as far north along the coast of Norway as uh, and things came to a head. Uh, the volunteer crew started quitting on them because they, they realized that the two owners hadn't got a clue as to what they were doing. And that part of the story requires a a good half hour to tell as to what actually took place. Okay, well we are at um, an, an hour and eight minutes so far, so we could go for maybe another 20 minutes for okay. this episode. Okay. And then we'll, we'll do another episode another time, so you just, yeah. what, whatever you want to share. All right, well, uh, I ended up, uh, what happened, because the vessel that I had come all the way from the U.S., to purchase uh, was essentially out of, out of my your hands, hands yeah. uh, and Perti Tarvis was so uh, distraught about the fact that we had come to buy his vessel and he had sold it to these two individuals which, um, you know, were, I'll go into that at some other time, but uh, okay. Perti decided that he was going to quit his job at the shipyard where he was working. There was a shipyard in the, in the little town, and take whatever length of time it took to for me to find another one along the coast of Sweden, Denmark, Norway, or Finland to and help you find a ship. To find a ship. And wow. so he and I and Barbara... He wanted to make this up to you somehow. He wanted to make it up to us. Yeah. And for three months, we combed the harbor shoreline, the harbor. harbors... and Looking for a nice for big ship a for nice sale. nice ship about that size. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we went wow. down to, to Denmark to start with, and they were vessels that were suitable, but they were fishing vessels that could be converted to what we were looking for, but... It wasn't ideal. Uh, it wasn't ideal because, A, the price was much higher. They were use, useful, and they were still fishing, mm. so we couldn't afford those, mm -hmm. so then we looked along the coast of uh, Sweden, and uh, we kept seeing vessels that uh, would be suitable, but they were much larger than the Kimbit. You know, they were a hundred feet on deck, and wow, I mean, that's a monster! Big, big vessels, and uh, it's too big. And like I, I kept saying, really and I said, yeah, I, you know, I don't have the experience of. Uh, handling a vessel of that size. Oh. I see, you know, the biggest one I've ever owned and or sail was a 45-foot schooner, uh, you know, and... Uh, so you were looking, uh, the Kimbit was how Kimbit was a nice size. Like 90 I, feet? Uh, yeah, overall. Uh, Total? About 65, 68 feet on deck. And I thought, oh yeah, progression-wise, it's the right size. And so mm -hmm. we look and never saw, we never found another one like it. And mm -hmm. so we ended up going to Finland, and uh, we went inside the, the Bay of Botnia, which is uh, uh, a bay that goes along uh, Finland and down to uh, Norway and part of Sweden and looking at all the harbors and everything, and everything we saw were in that size category. Everything? A hundred, a hundred and ten feet on Oh, just a little too big. A little too big. And I kept saying, you know, God, the amount of money it's going to require for us to fix them up. And I mean, it's going to be... Just too much boat. Too much boat for the amount of money that we have. And, uh, and we went on the Finn... Russian border, uh, past Sibo, and in Finland, and uh, there was an island there uh, that uh, 
well, the whole coast of Finland is like 10,000 islands. There are islands everywhere. Uh -huh. uh, and, you know, people would say, well, you know, so, so and so has one, he's over there. And so we would uh, hop from island to island, yeah, looking, across from island to island on little ferries or this and that. Uh -huh. And then we ended up on this island of the coast of Finland. That's how you were getting around? It was on ferries and with the ferries car? Ferries and the car and hopping from one place to the other, leaving oh. the car there, or hopping on a, on a ferry and going to see a vessel. And we saw one, you know, called the Lyra. The Lyra? L-Y-R-A, Lyra. Oh, interesting, you know. And it was low down oh. in the water. And, uh, you know, we went and looked at it with the uh, um, the rental boat that we were on and then we went ashore and met the owner his name is Elge Johansson and Elge oh yeah yeah I'm selling her and, uh, and he wasn't talking to me because I couldn't speak a word of Finn okay but that's My right. partner Petty is a Finn, so he po he spoke and translated everything. Yeah, it's for sale, and uh, what? And he wouldn't tell us the price. Uh. Uh, we had to discuss that in a different setting, uh -huh. and um, so we looked at it. And I kept saying to Petty, "I say it's too freaking big, a little too big still." You know, I mean, this thing is. Uh, look at it. I mean, Jesus, man. I mean. Uh, you know, what is it going to take to fix it and to get mass to put in and rig it and make a sailing ship out of it? I said, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't have the money. I just have enough money to buy a vessel, but not beyond that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, so we left and continued looking and we looked for three months. I never did see. <laughs> never did find something <laughs> quite the right. No, and fit. finally, you know, out of frustration, we came back to look at the Lyra. The Lyra. And we come back a second time, and uh, Elge invited us to go on board, and yeah, yeah, go ahead, you know. And uh, so we climbed the ladders and got up on board because you know it's not like a sailboat that you see in uh, no you know, this is I mean, like this, a ship this is a ship yeah. you climb a ladder to get on deck yeah you know so we got on there and we're standing at the uh, on the stern end of it and here's the, the wheel and we're looking at it and uh, we're both looking at it well you know what she's not that big <laughs> We can swing it. Yeah, we can do this. You know, I mean, we've seen so many of this size and, you know, you become familiar with the size and uh, it's and you like... feel more uh, comfortable yeah, with it. Yeah, familiarity breeds contempt. You What's know? that? Familiarity breeds contempt. Familiarity breeds contempt. Contempt. And you say, yeah, we can do this, you know. <laughs> and so let's go and talk to Elgi. So let's go talk to Elgi. Make a deal. So Elge invited us in a sauna because Finland is, that's what you do. You don't yeah, take so showers. There is no shower. There's no shower. You just sweat it out. <laughs> you, you do saunas, you know. And so we ended up in a sauna with him, his wife, his kids, me, oh, the whole family Perti, there. and uh, Barbara and myself, all of us. Bare assed. <laughs> All you totally naked. Totally in naked a in the sauna. You don't take a sauna with cl any clothes no. on. They're not in Finland. Uh -huh. You know, and the temperature in the sauna is like 160, 170. Oh my God. And I mean, it's that, baking you. Wow. So you were not used to being in the, no, that temperature. No, and uh, it's like, oh my God. You're not going to last you know? as long and, in there. Uh, they have. Their uh, setup in the saunas have seating. There's a bench, then there's a higher bench, and then there's a higher bench. Oh. And the ones who have... Like bleachers. Yeah, the ones who are really into sauna, they sit on the higher bench. Because that's where it's the hottest. Where it's the hottest. Uh, I was down at the lowest. The lowest. Trying to breathe. Trying to breathe. Trying to breathe. <laughs> get, 
some wow, hair. Yeah. And then uh, and, and here you are trying to negotiate the purchase. Of yeah. And the Elgate Lyra. comes in with a uh, six pack of beer. <laughs> That'll come and in. And a package of uh, sausage called ah. Komkorva is what they are called in Finland. And uh, uh, he took the sausage and put them on the hot stones and open a beer and oh. pour it on the hot stone. Beer. When you pour liquid on on a hot fire like this, the temperature goes up by another 20, 30 degrees. It does? Oh, the steam instantaneous. adds heat. I mean, it was like... God, Get me you know, out of here. I mean, yeah, literally. They said you were just hanging in there. Just hanging in there, and I stood it because I didn't see anybody moving, and I thought... You oh, didn't want to be the first one? Though. Yeah, I don't want to be looking like a, uh, it was, <laughs> and I said, you know, God, this is so freaking hot. How that do was, you guys do this? And finally, I saw... Uh, Perti said, "Well, uh, let's let's go out and uh, jump in the water and uh, cool off. and uh, you know uh, their idea of jumping in the water is this was on a on the Baltic, you know, on the edge of the Baltic. The so island. you're going from like a hundred and down to about uh, forty degree temperature water, just like that. <laughs> oh my God, it's gonna freeze. You're gonna be like, and I mean, off. and you cannot feel." the 40 degrees. You can't feel it? No. Your body is so hot, so imbued with, with heat. heat that it takes about wow. five minutes before you start feeling eh, it's oh getting kind of cold. Wow. It takes a while for the body temperature to come down to, to meet the cold water wow, you're into. Wow, that's the opposite of what I would have expected. I thought and it would have been a shock. I cold. want to tell you, you're both out of there because you want more. More water. hot. More hot. I need to warm back up yeah, now. Yeah, and you need to go back oh. in to do it again. <laughs> and, I mean, it was just a hoot. Oh it was a hoot. And uh, we... Um, uh, we concluded the deal. You know, we told him, he asked what we were going to do with it. I, we told them that we were um, going to, you know, strip the decks of anything extra and start building mast and cross yards and make a square rig ship out of it. And, you know, and, you know, very, um, the right word is uh, taciturn, you know, he didn't. Didn't smile much. He just listened. Taciturn. He didn't Taciturn. smile. No, no. Just listened. He listened and uh, wanted to hear that uh, you know we were serious about doing what we were saying we were going to do. And he said, "Okay." He says, "I'll sell it to you." And we bought it for five thousand dollars. Wow. Yeah. And this was around nineteen seventy something. Nineteen seventy. Yeah. Wow. So, so he wanted to know that he was putting his boat into some good hands. In some good hands, and that's what uh, that's what we did. Uh, we ended up purchasing it. It had a small engine in it, which he had put in um, a few years earlier. And to describe this vessel, when the Second World War uh, began, the Russians, who are their neighbors, uh, wanted to take some of the land that belonging to Finland. Historical dispute from 18 whenever, and uh -huh. they, you know, the Russians. They wanted to resolve it and they say, were claim, to, hey, yeah, this is our so land. So they attacked Finland, and Finland. A, a country of three million people stood up to a hundred and fifty million Russians, and they fought them to a standstill. Oh my gosh! They are, it's an amazing story. These people are just so. These were residents who just took yeah, arms. They and took arms and land. they decided we're going to stop them from uh -huh. doing it. They did take some of the territory, but they could have invaded the whole of Finland if they had had the gumption to mm -hmm. put the effort behind. But, but there they was were, resistance. The, the resistance was formidable. And uh, so 
there was no friendliness between Russia and Russia Finland. And, Finland. and um, what happened is when the war began, there was a coastal fleet of ships that were used to transport sand, granite, um, you know, anything for construction material that went around the coast of Finland. And the Finns during the war um, ended up using those ships by mounting cannons on them. Oh. Well, wooden boats with a cannon on it. It's a pretty dangerous mixture. <laughs> it's a dangerous mixture, but one hit from the opponent. And you're going down. You're going down. Yeah. And 48 of them were shot out and, oh, and destroyed and sunk. And people, obviously, uh, many people loved their life, but uh, so on and so forth. End of the war. Let's fast forward to the end of the war. This country created a, a program called the Marshall Plan. And Finland or? Oh, U.S. Okay. Oh, the U.S. created the Marshall Plan? It created the Marshall Plan. At the end General of Marshall. Uh, end of World War II? At the end of World War II, they decided to give each country, England, France, uh, all of the European countries, some money to rebuild. rebuild whatever they could with that money. Uh -huh. To what amount, I can't be specific. Finland got a chunk of it. And what they did, they passed some of that money to the people who had lost their ships oh. during the war to rebuild whatever yeah. they could with that well, money. Yeah, and they, they need people to move ground yeah. and, and uh, construction the, uh, the long and the short of it, the Finns were so uh, appreciative of America having provided them with some relief, um, some money. Millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, and some support. That, um, they formed a group. Of, uh, the initial group was 48. 48 members of families who had lost their ship. And to honor America, they created a, a vessel, and that's what the unicorn looked like, with oh. the clipper bow, which was a distinctive feature of ships that were created in America in the 18... Oh, uh, so it was like an American-style ship. American-style, with the stern, America. also fat body, but both ends were reflect the a, a different era and so that's what the unicorn uh, body looked like when we got it and when you looked at it from Is, you, you said wow you know you said wow yeah i mean it was uh i mean it made your it was beautiful. heart oh, it was beautiful, beautiful to look at yeah but it was just the hall because just a hall. he was done with it he, Elge, was done with it, and he had already purchased a steel hull freighter. So are we talking about the Lyra? Yeah. Lyra became the unicorn? Became the unicorn. And it was one of those ships that it were It was built. one of those 48 ships. Oh my gosh, it's a really neat historical... Yeah, uh, yeah, and... Uh, wow. And uh, we ended up buying it and... For $5,000. $5,000. And... I can see why Pietre... Well, no, I can see... Petit. Petit. Well, I can see why why the seller of of the Lyra yeah. was you know he was so concerned with okay who's taking who's this into their hands and yeah, what are they going to do with what it? What are they going to do with it? Because it's a historical ship. Yeah, and he he didn't just want it to be a turn into a restaurant or whatever you know. No, he want he wanted to make sure that it was actually going to be used, mm. and so it had an engine in it. A small and, one. Yeah, Elgi, uh, Elgi had essentially put an engine in it because when he first got it, he sailed or under sail with uh, a catch rig and uh, he put in uh, the only engines he could find to put in there and it was a, uh, a bus, 
euh, Boss, Volkswagen, euh, Volkswagen. Euh, non, non, les Volkswagen oh. et euh, euh, GMC, GMC Bus, Bus Engine. Engine. So probably and a with the whole long. transmission and everything attached to it. 150 horsepower to power a ship that way. <laughs> That was like 90 feet long. Yeah, I mean, he, wow. he could, uh, you know, he could go he in and out of harbors with it. Yeah, but that's around. about as much as it could do. As long as it the wind could, wasn't blowing. <laughs> yeah, and if the one wind was blowing contrary, then he had to anchor and wait till It'll it wait. blew, uh, you know, and so on. So, hmm. so it had that engine in it. And uh, after we purchased it, we chug a chug a chug slowly to... Uh, Helsinki in Finland. How far was that? Oh, I'd say about 140, 30, 40 miles so away. Very and slowly. Very slowly, hiding behind the islands to do from it. From the wind? No, from the Russians. Oh, hiding from the Russians? <laughs> yeah, because uh, we had the only flag we had to put on the stern was an American flag. And, you know, you're in the Baltic. That's. Uh, Their Russian territory. water, yeah. Basically, they uh -huh. they consider that Russian water, and they could give you a hard time if they see an American. Yeah, flag. you bet. And so, and Elgia told us, he says, you know, when nighttime comes, you hide behind the island, Jeez, and keep Louise. an eye out for the Russians, and he says you'll see them because they've got great big spotlights, and they just. Uh, go looking for. Um, they're they're scanning the scanning sea. between uh, between island to see who's moving, who's going anywhere, and if they see a a, a vessel on the move, they will stop you. And uh, you know you're American, and they're Soviets, and who knows what'll happen. So uh, it took a while to get it to. Uh, El it sounds like a scary, stressful. It trip. was. Uh, it was interesting. And when we got to Helsinki, we found a, a yard that could haul her out and put her on a on a railway and, uh, and shore yeah, it up and shore it up. And uh, we got to see the bottom of it and uh, you know on the side. And I've got tons of pictures of oh, all really? that. Oh really? And. Uh, and get to work. Start. And get to work. And we cleaned her up and painted the bottom. And before we hauled her out, we had all the sand uh, with a crane uh, pulled out of the cargo holds because she sand. was, yeah, because uh, Elgi put a mountain of sand in both cargo holds oh, in it. To weigh it down? To weigh it down so that the sides of the ship because it's a wooden vessel, it's underwater. So it'll swell. So it keeps her tight. Tight. And so we hauled all that out of there and uh, cleaned out the bilge. It was dry and, uh, you know, it could carry about 200 tons of... Uh, wow. Yeah, 200 tons of uh, sand boat. or granite or whatever. And um, so... You put a lot of sand in there. We... Painted her and uh, and ended up uh, launching her again and uh, you know this we, time it sat a little higher. Oh, it sat <laughs> quite a bit higher, yeah. yeah. And uh, and just motored on down to Sweden. That was your first trip on that the was unicorn. Our first Did, trip. was at this point was it called the unicorn? I called it the unicorn, and the reason I called her the unicorn, um, it's because. When I was a child, during the time that my parents were having their life's adventure, one in the forest, the other one in, uh, in as a nurse, you know, uh, and that requires a whole other story, and I'm not going to go into it today, but uh, I was living in Paris as a four or five-year-old child, with my grandparents and my grandfather was uh, he was to become the uh, the ambassador of uh, France for Belgium oh and, wow and um, he had a great big villa oh he was know. a big deal he was a big deal yeah and uh, so I lived with him and his wife second wife oh that's neat and uh, so I essentially lived 
in Paris during the occupation and um, but he had a boat a, ma mainly a um, a rowboat if you could call it, if you could describe it well it was a flat bottom thing about 18 feet long with a short bow sprit sticking out of the bow like a point yeah, like a point and, and a, a little mast and uh, he used to row it out in the middle of the river drop a, up, uh... the hook and uh, fish oh. and he took me out there a couple of times and I was one of the first exposure to to being on a boat the, being on the boat at five years old yeah and I and there was a previous time before that and, uh, but um, that was my exposure. And, that and was his the... boat was called La Licorne. L-A-L-I-C-O-R-N-E. La Licorne. La Licorne, which in French is unicorn in English. Oh, li so La is the La li the one. Licorne. The and Licorne. The li Licorne, yeah. Oh, okay, and that translates and as unicorn. As unicorn. And so... When I so knew, you took this little 18-foot wood boat yeah, that you were inspired by as at, at was five years old. For, from that point on, my whole life was centered around and unicorn. And so when you found your ship, yeah. the, the one, you I named it the unicorn. the unicorn. The big unicorn. The big unicorn. And with a long bowsprit. And oh, and it did have a nice oh, big... Oh, well, we ended up building all of that into it. And figurehead on the bow and all of this. Oh, cool. And that's how uh, the unicorn became what she became. What color was it? She was uh, uh, varnished with what's called Stockholm tar, which is a, a liquid tar comes out of pine trees and you put it on wood and it looks like varnish. Oh, so it was, she was wood colored. A wood color a nice rich with black. With black. On the bottom. On the bottom. And red bottom. And red and, bottom. Uh, she was spectacular. Wood, black, and red. Yeah, oh, oh, she boy. was, she was some, she was something else. Yeah. Uh, she was, oh, man. The ship of a lifetime. Yeah. She was my right arm. Your right arm. Yeah. I, uh. How cool. Yeah. I think we'll stop it right All here. right, so yeah. that's the story of how the unicorn was born. That's how the unicorn was born, yeah. Thanks, Jacques Thierry. This You're welcome. Neat. And, uh, you know, there's plenty more stories where okay. those come from. So I look can, forward to more stories. Uh, we can do it again and uh, get into, you know, details, uh, other sure. stories uh, about my... Uh, bringing parents and all of this and, uh, you know, uh, all of this we can do this okay. uh, as a side. So, so until the next episode of the West Puget Community Connection podcast, thanks again so much, Jacques. You're very welcome. It was fun. Indeed. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the West Puget Community Connection podcast. Be sure to catch the next episode. Sign up for our email list at westpugetcommunityconnection.com and you'll be notified when new episodes are published. And if you're interested in advertising or being featured on the show, you can contact us through our website as well, westpugetcommunityconnection.com. The West Puget Community Connection podcast is brought to you in part by mywebdesignservices.com. Quick, easy, affordable websites that look amazing across all devices. For a quote or to get started today, visit mywebdesignservices.com. The West Puget Community Connection Podcast. This is where we learn about the people of our community. We learn what they do, and more importantly, why they do it. Subscribe by email at westpugetcommunityconnection.com. We look forward to learning more about you.